Hey everyone, welcome to the compilation of the full three-part Naruto Not About Ninja mini series. There is no real reason for us to beat around the bush, and it's pretty self-explanatory. So obviously everything is here for you to enjoy all in one big video. One thing to note is, just keep everything in context, I'm going to be trying to trim as little off the intros and outros that are necessary in parts one and three. Anyway, please go ahead and subscribe because it does a lot to help me out and just motivate me. Leave a like and comment your thoughts below, and enjoy the show. This video is sponsored by DJ The Lazy Gamer and Crimson Manifesto. Hey y'all, and welcome to the first of three What If Minis entitled What If Naruto Was Not About Ninja. I know the title is self-explanatory, but to clarify, we'll be exploring three different worlds in which the story of Naruto and Boruto is adapted in a world where the main gimmick isn't ninjas or ninjutsu. Also, full disclosure before we begin with this first one, I ended up swapping the orders of the stories from their original numbering when I first announced them, as I feel like the fantasy setting kind of moves away from the ninja the least. I'm sure you'd probably assume the samurai setting would have that issue as well, but I honestly think that I'll be able to give that story a different enough spin, whereas here, though, with the superpowers and talking magical animals and stuff like that, it seems it just isn't a ton of stuff we would have had to shift over for this to work out. The mechanics and characters of Naruto just really apply super well to that kind of classic isekai slash RPG style of storytelling. That said, I really hope you will stick it out and check out those later two parts, as my goal was to make sure we could finish off strong, rather than starting really Really strong and then finishing off kind of meh. Also in interest of full disclosure, as I'm sure those of you who are going to be familiar with these series, I'm taking some fairly heavy inspiration from things like the Tolkien verse, so Lord of the Rings, The Hobbit, Fairy Tale, Black Clover, Mashal Magic and Muscles, Magi, Shaman King, Fullmetal Alchemist, and just throwing some throwbacks that I'm curious who amongst you will recognize, Tai Chi Chasers and Huntik. Ah, and of course, every isekai slash fantasy anime ever, you absolute degenerates. Also, this really is the last thing before we begin, please do me a favor and subscribe to the channel as well as leaving a like and commenting your thoughts on this part as well as the future ones, as these are all great and simultaneously free ways to support my content. Now this premise can work because as of chapter 75 of Boruto, we've learned some really interesting information. That shinobi arts like Nin and Senjutsu are actually offshoots of Shinjutsu, abilities of the oldest Otsutsuki we've learned up to date named Shibai, who seems to have evolved beyond the state of needing a physical body. Basically, he attained godhood. And this is not to mention that most ninjutsu by the end of the series pretty much do work and look very much like what basic magic abilities in other series look like, rather than something I could argue only ninja would be doing. We do after all go from creating mist to hide in and covertly attack your opponent stealthily to summoning literal meteors to drop on opposing armies. So as such, I think ninjutsu, or in this world, forms of magic, would be fairly similar in major ways with chakra just serving as the MP gauge pretty much, but likely not being referred to as chakra in this realm. And thus, a lot of the world's history and lore can remain the same up until the Sage of Six Paths first begins using ninjutsu and the different forms of shinobi abilities begin to be created. Here we'll say that Hagoromo ends up figuring out that he can somehow get his abilities to be closer to Shinjutsu by channeling his power through an object that can act like a medium, something like a staff actually. These objects more than likely being very specialized and individualized for every specific user, so they act kind of like your magic wands or grimoires or spell books. So therefore, Hagoromo passes this knowledge down to his children in Dren Ashura, and from there, humanity do as in canon and learn from them developing their own magic and different kinds of spells, as well as creating different specialties tied to one's bloodline and lineage, and of course, using them for war and conquest. From here, of course, we would then get into the era of Hashirama and Madara, and while you could just look at them as strong mages, I think you can really lean into the setting a little bit more and play with Madara's boogeyman status, letting him become something more like your typical RPG demon lord, with Hashirama of course taking up the role of the legendary hero. Which considering his world famous status and the fact that he has your somewhat classical mythological hero's labors like forming the first treaty between the five nations, subduing and distributing the tail beast, and defeating Madara, it kind of works out. And speaking of Jinchuriki and sealing arts in general, they would probably still exist here. If anything, they would possibly be even less rare. I could very much see in a scenario like this, where magic is a little simpler to explain to the layman than secret of shinobi arts were, people would probably want to become Jinchuriki, just for the power. Since you would also still have that natural divide where some people are kind of just born to be civilians and have naturally less chakra than other people's, whereas in this world it's just you have naturally less mana than other people. Plus, fantasy worlds are so much more fun when humans aren't the only sentient creatures in them, and where say if a dragon and a human were to fall in love for example, they can produce viable offspring because, you know, magic. And this would tie magnificently into the original concept of Kekigenkai, 
So while I won't waste time listing all the different kinds of races our characters could be here, you'll notice that a few familiar faces aren't referred to as human. Like for example, in this world, the Uchiha will be referred to as Dark Elves, whereas the Hyuga, even though they don't really come up much here, are your more common Wood Elves. Also, in terms of groundwork kind of laid out for lore reasons, they obviously wouldn't be referring to any major conflicts as Shinobi World Wars. But maybe it's just World Wars, since I don't think everyone would be a straight up magic wand waving wizard, but rather would use their chakra or their magic slash geki genkai in some similar ways as they did as ninja. The most notable thing is that most forms of physical or stealth combat from the ninja world would be fairly rare in this one. Or like, since I think summoning magic would be its own kind of thing that some people would specialize in, you could kind of see what I was talking about earlier with some people kind of seeking out being Jinchuriki and maybe trying to find ways to seal certain summons inside of themselves, creating kind of a graded Jinchuriki system the same way Shinobi are ranked in terms of danger. Though admittedly, this could certainly be a fruitless effort since the tail beasts are actually masses of sentient chakra, while summons like Gamabunta, for example, are implied to be physically flesh and blood like the Shinobi who summoned them. Still though, they are pretty much just naturally occurring animals with higher than normal levels of chakra. While we're at it, let's also go ahead and do what I was just talking about and break down most of the really iconic shinobi abilities into some different main branches of magic so we don't waste time doing stuff like that later on. You'd obviously have your basic elemental or caster magic, since I can't think of many fantasy settings without this staple. I don't think there are many wizard builds in, say, D&D where you can't cast Fireball or something like that. And because that lends itself really well to the idea of chakra natures and the elemental combo keke genkai like ice release, the vast majority of mages would simply specialize in this kind of stuff, since it would probably be the easiest to get a grasp of. Basically, produce something out of magic and then lob it at the opponent. Doesn't really get much simpler than that. But then as you get into the more complicated stuff, you would again need a new category. So for example, there would be illusion magic, which would basically represent genjutsu. Very self-explanatory. Or like techniques that basically just amp a person's physical stats like the eight gates would likely be considered something like augmentation magic. And again, these would still be really rare in this world. And obviously stuff like taijutsu or just martial arts in general would be even more rare. As for something like Senjutsu or Sage Art, because of their explanation, you could probably most accurately describe this as Druidic Magic. Or maybe you would just label these techniques as Ant by Nature Chakra as the Druidic version of that technique. Sealing Jutsu, as I said, could also be transplanted pretty one to one. But since seals usually require a physical formula to be drawn out and have a chakra channel through them, we would be more on brand to label this as rune magic or something like that. This is actually kind of a really fun mental exercise. So if you guys have any ideas for like what you would call, say, the healing arts or medical ninjutsu and stuff like that, let me know in the comments. I'd really like to hear what you have to say. So with all this groundwork laid out, we can actually get into the little vignette of this part. Naruto in the World of Fantasy, Nine Tail. Donzos and Dragons. Our story begins with our hero, a recent graduate from the Leaf Kingdom's magic school. Becoming a fledgling mage after a conundrum with a corrupt instructor leads to him passing the final exam in a very roundabout way, but learning a startling secret in the process. You see, this boy, Naruto, is cursed with being the warden to one of the nine great demons of his world. In fact, the greatest and most powerful of the nine, the fox. And because of this, he has always had a great deal of trouble controlling his naturally vast pool of magic. This combined with the lack of knowledge and outside aid led to the boy only knowing how to really flare his power as a rather impressive bluff before having to resort to fistcuffs as useless as they are in this world. Until very recently, he had no spells or abilities of note. But after stealing a forbidden grimoire written by the Leaf Kingdom's previous supreme sorcerers, he was able to copy a spell known as the Shadow Clone. Forbidden simply because of how drastic the drain on one's MP is to create even one clone. But using his curse as a blessing, Naruto declares himself as the first clone mage able to summon armies with only the snap of his fingers and overwhelm his opponents. It is with this form of confidence that the Demon Warden steps into his classroom to be assigned to a sorcerer squad with two other beginning mages and a high mage as their teacher. However, much of his happiness and confidence drains away after it is announced that one of his teammates is to be the village's dark elf prince, Sasuke Uchiha. Also, very quick note, I'm just now thinking to clarify this. I know I called Madara a demon, but we're gonna say that it's a title, just like Hashirama's hero status was. And unfortunately, despite his best efforts, this perfect bastard and Naruto have never really gotten along. Partially due to his own immaturity and unwillingness to open up after being shunned by the kingdom, and partially because everything about the elf pissed him off. However, his mood is instantly improved once his half-orc crush Sakura Haruno is announced to be the final team member, causing the girl to seem torn between being happy and mortified. As they are announced as Team 7, they are told to wait for a sorcerer named Kakashi Harake, who will serve as their teacher. He is of course late and after enduring a prank from Naruto, decides he isn't too fond of the trio so far. 
We then get into the team introductions and it's the pretty typical stuff that you already know. I want to be the greatest supreme sorcerer ever. I want to date this hot emo elf. I want to kill my evil brother who slaughtered my entire drove of elves. Unimpressed, Kakashi informs them they haven't actually graduated just yet and still have to pass a second test of his choosing. So the next day, the magic bell test begins. The objective still being to capture the bells through whatever means necessary. Whether that be using a spell which can actually incapacitate Kakashi and claim them, or using a spell which can just straight up take the bells. Also, as another fun change, I actually don't think there will be any real attempt by the teacher giving the test to obfuscate that the goal is teamwork. For one thing, the whole see through deception thing was more so of an aspect of ninja. Not to mention thematically, teamwork as a concept kind of fits magic users better than it does Shinobi, since most magicians as performers have always used assistance as ways to distract the audience from the sleight of hand behind their actual trick. There would likely just be three bells, and the objective would just be to coordinate and successfully capture the bells straightforwardly. Even so, this dysfunctional trio bicker instead of forming a plan, with Naruto wanting to take center stage instead of Sasuke, as Sakura demands he fill the role as the future couple's assistant. Fed up with this, the clone mage decides to go it alone. Using his very body as a conduit for his vast magic, he fills their training ground with a hundred doppelgangers, all ready for battle. However, with the wave of his staff, Kakashi reveals that his magic is that of copying, and thus, with some fatigue, it's able to reduce Naruto's number advantage with only 10 clones of his own which are easily able to mow the blonde army down with low-level spells the copy mage had picked up over the years. Scoffing that she expected as much, Sakura steps up next and removes a massive battle axe used as her conduit from her back with ease. Channeling her muscle magic through it, she slams the weapon into the ground and creates a large fissure in order to swallow up the older mage, only willing to release him if he relinquishes the bells for her and Sasuke. But instead, simply copying her magic, Kakashi is easily able to jump out of the chasm and simply flicks a rock at the half-orc, which pings between her eyes, leaving her in a heap alongside Naruto. As he looks back to Sasuke to ask if he's sure he wants to continue this, his single visible eye widens as he uses the last of his muscle magic to move quick enough to dodge as two arrows cracking with fiery lightning zoom past his face. Looking back to the young Dark Elf Weapon Mage, and showing surprise at how well he is able to control his ability for a beginner, before being forced to dodge another barrage of arrows. Finally growing tired of this, Sasuke unsheaths the Elven Forge Mithril Sword, which begins to glow and hum with the force of the Avengers magic as he rushes to cleave his would-be teacher in two, only to soon find himself buried up to the neck, as Kakashi had simply used Earth magic he'd copied in the past to make a big hole for the boy to fall into, walking forward to end the test by bonking the elf into unconsciousness with his staff. Once the trio awaken to see Kakashi has eaten all their lunches, he begins to lecture them, questioning how they didn't see the obvious win condition of the fight by just combining their talents. If they had simply had Naruto use his clone magic on Sakura while she uses her muscle magic and finally had Sasuke use weapon magic to enhance the weapons of the Sakura army, his goose would have been cooked. However, ignoring this, the young hungry mages all vent their anger at him in near perfect sync each dressing him down in a way that builds off the last insult, whether it be the drab and old school way the wizard dresses, to his magic being bootleg versions of other people's according to Naruto. Sweat dropping, Kagashi at least praises them for finally working together on something, and begrudgingly passes the trio as his students, mostly because they're entertaining if nothing else. But sadly, Plus Ultra Fam, that is where I'm going to be leaving this story off forever. Again, I really hope you'll forgive me for the very abrupt end on this one, as it was pretty much just majority setup for the world. I was really trying to do my best to move over what aspects of Naruto's DNA into this different setting that I could that wouldn't really hurt anything, but I'm certain mileage is going to vary for a lot of you. And as I've just said, I'm really not willing to try and come back and continue these that much since I just don't see that much narrative meat on the bones myself. However, if any of you out there are really invested in seeing more of this story, you 100% have my blessing to use this part as a jumping off point for your own take of this idea. Or feel free to completely scrap it and start your own if you believe you just have a better way to start the premise. And on top of all that, please let me know so I can try and share it to my community because I'm sure the few of you who probably will have enjoyed this would like to see somebody try and continue it if they do. Hey guys, and welcome to part 2 of 3 of the What If Naruto Was Not About Ninja miniseries. This one is called Guts, the Samurai Who Smells of Ramen Bros. I'm not going to waste any time setting up the premise of the project this time as I did all that in part 1, so if you need a refresher, go give it a watch and then come back here afterwards. Before you do though, make sure you subscribe, turn on your notifications so you never miss an upload, and leave a like and a comment to make your view and this video's performance 4 times as effective. Now a few of you familiar with Samurai Shonen or just Edo period based stories in general are going to be able to tell a lot of my inspiration 
Revelations are Gintama, Samurai 8, even though admittedly not much as I actually haven't really read it, and it's actually about sci-fi concepts if I'm not mistaken. The Elusive Samurai, Shampoo, pretty much all of One Piece's Wano arc, Vagabond, and even that one iconic shonen manga, a lot of people find difficult to talk about or try and enjoy, since it can sometimes be hard to separate an artist from their art. Also, unlike last part, I am not going to set up a bunch of world building. The basics will be it's just Naruto using samurai swords, so much more straightforward and honor bound Kenjutsu kind of combat. Shinobi and some ninjutsu will still exist here, but they're more so going to be the one hit kill shot stuff, because you know, Shinobi weren't really supposed to fight, and if they did, it was supposed to be to assassinate, so it's going to be things like the Rasengan, the Chidori, stuff that if you're going to use, you know you're going to take the opponent down. Otherwise, there aren't going to be any clone ninjutsu, any substitutions, none of that kind of stuff, no genjutsu, any of that, which kind of isn't really straightforward, you know, fighting combat is going to be frowned upon and not really taught in this world. As for the lore here, most of the history of Naruto's world will remain very much the same. You already have the Land of Iron and Samurai there, so we're just kind of moving that to be the main setting of stories. Thus, Madara and Hachirama are born in the Land of Iron instead of fire, and when they go out and achieve their ambitions, it is as samurai fighting for the same nation state rather than shinobi. And like I said, chakra and things like Kekigenkai still do exist, so Hashirama's Kekigenkai still manifests, but he mostly just used it to create sturdy bokens or training swords, capable of withstanding his great power. He partially does this because he doesn't actually like to kill his enemies, and thus made a kenjutsu style based around non-lethality, a special rarity among the myriad of different ways of war the samurai of the world have devised to use their chakra for. While Madara's Kekigenkai and power have evolved into a swift and merciless hand of dark justice, allowing him to see into the very soul and the weakest points of anyone's heart when he fights them, and basing his philosophy around slaying evil immediately. However, unlike Hashirama's original goal for peace in the main timeline, this time he sees the path to peace as much more largely paved through using order and unity, these also being important tenets in his Bushido code, and thus he sets out to unify the world under a single banner, alongside Madara, who in this world is both a more loyal warrior and someone whose code inclines him to agree with his friend. As such, I honestly don't see the two ever really coming into a real conflict, which means this would be a somewhat idealized timeline, at least for them. The Tailed Beast also exists in this world, but as there aren't multiple nations, it is decided to simply seal one through eight tails away in randomly and fairly selected children, who are actually held as heroes rather than being shunned, all eventually rising up to a special class to serve as the Shogunate's special eight demon blade. However, the Nine Tails as the most powerful, hateful, and unruly is forbidden to be sealed in anyone. And every time it reforms a stronger hate than the last time, the world of Samurai band together to kill it once again. And so time passes, as new generations and leaders come. The heir of the second Shogun, Tobirama, and his right hand, Izuna, is an easy heir to transition to. Being younger brothers of the first Shogunate leaders, their rule hardly varies. The third heir is just as smooth the transition, as the new Shogun Hiruzen and his Lieutenant Danzu are the students of the second. But finally, great change comes in the fourth, as a Shogun by the name of Minato Namikaze, supported by a descendant of Madara himself named Fugaku as his right hand, succeed Hashirama and Madara's legacy. However, for some unprecedented reason, Minato decides to break tradition and seals the Nine Tails inside his newborn son. Instantly, the world turns on him shunning he and his wife, the Oida on Kushina, as apostates and fellow demons on their world. But after successfully hiding their child, Minato and Kushina fight the very world itself. The conflict's only coming to an end when they are captured by Fugaku, and are forced to slit their bellies in order to stop the hunt for their child. Afterwards, Fugaku places the impotence of the next era of the world as being protected by their founder's legacy and philosophy, slay evil instantly. It is with this ideal that he raises his two sons, as he seeks for his firstborn, Itachi Jiro, to become the next Shogun since he now serves as a lieutenant for the third Shogun once again. Itachi of course rails against this, and eventually abandons the Shogunate altogether, becoming a ronin along with two former retainers of the fourth. Because of this, the second born, Sasunosuke, grows up with a grudge against both his own brother and Narutaro, though he does not know that name. A decade passes in the blink of an eye almost, as Fugaku's second son, now seen as the Shogunate's messiah, had become the leader of the police force by the age of 12 growing and learning from the past in preparation for his goal, and helping his contemporaries making the new current generation of samurai the strongest in history. Now at the age of 16, the young man has petitioned his father and the Shogun to allow him to start his pilgrimage, in order to find and slay the Ninetales bear, as well as to track down and bring back the head of his own brother. The Shogun thinks long and hard about this, as his gut tells him to send some of the eight blades to the boy, but this offer is refused by both father and son, as it will weaken the Shogun's defenses. So it is Fugaku who gives his blessing first, ordering his child to remain resolute in his pursuit of the villains. Seeing that he likely can't convince against this, the third Shogun allows this, with the small hope that maybe this is the last step needed before a new peaceful era can begin. 
so alone is not to be weighed down, the samurai Sasunosuke Uchiha sets off into the world. His journey beginning first in the land of snow and iron, and quickly taking him further from his homeland than he'd ever dare steps. This realization makes him consider his mother, as it only now fully hits him that it could be a very long time until he returns and can see her or his father again. However, remembering his code, these emotions are cut down as soon as they arise. And as he travels across the land, these feelings are not the only things which are cut down. As Sasunosuke allows his blade to bite the flesh of random Ronin and measly bandits at whenever possible. All the while practicing his way of the killing sword as often as he can, as he is aware the experience will be needed when it comes time to cross swords with his brother or the man wielding the demonic power of the Ninetales. Finally, reaching a sunny and green land known as the Land of Fire, Sasunosuke proceeds down a forest path, splotched and spotted with the pinpricks of light cast down from the warm summer evening sun, shining on the dense forest. However, a stranger, a broken youth, approaches from the opposite direction, one whom bears a sword in his hip and a travel bundle braced and held over his shoulder. Upon closer inspection, the Uchiha boy finally sees the golden blonde hair and whisker marks bared on the other boy, causing him to stop moments after they had passed one another, and in turn, making the blonde stop himself. Sasunosuke then asks what school of swordsmanship the other man has studied in, but instead of an answer, the whisker-marked boy declares it to be none of the raven-haired boy's business, and that if he'd excuse him, he was busy bringing dinner back for his family, and would appreciate not being sidetracked, since it was going to be ramen. However, hearing the ring of a blade slowly being drawn halts him again, as killing intent leaks off of the other samurai, as he then accuses the blonde of being a ronin, as well as being guilty of breaking the edict to get scaring a sword without the proper training in its use or safety. Hearing this, the blonde boy scoffs and brags that the other boy knew nothing of proper training or safety precautions with the weapon of war if he'd so casually draw it and express bloodlust in a situation where he has not been threatened. Besides this, true warriors have no need for a sword, and his is only meant to act as a deterrent. However, Sasunosuke clarifies that he isn't doing this just because of his duty to uphold the law, but also because he knows the boy's true identity as the Nine Tails Bearer, and with that accusation, the black-haired swordsman draws his blade and slices with full intent to kill only failing due to his opponent drawing his sword and his metal scabbard up to block the blow entirely, thus bringing the two eye to eye for the first time. Seeing the sheathed blade, Sasunosuke demands to be taken seriously, advising that the other young man draw it if he wishes for his death to be an honorable one. However, his target politely refuses, stating men like him who've been shunned by the world have no need for honor. And to prove this, his free hand holding his bindle suddenly raises allowing the little pouch of ramen ingredients to plop to the floor thus freeing the stick for full movement, which is taken advantage of to suddenly come down and be cracked in two on Sasuke head. While he reels from the blow, instead of retreating backwards, he drives his knee into the exposed gut of the blonde, with enough force to send him skidding back and create a gap between them. Remembering his station, Sasunosuke announced his name, title, and destiny, part of those stated ambitions getting a slight twitch of reaction from Narutaro, that the black-haired swordsman assumes a shock at being hated long before this meeting. After an awkward cicada chirp-filled silence, the samurai demands the ronin give him his name, causing the blonde to sigh and rudely comply. Smirking, Sasunosuke then says he'll be sure they spell it correctly on his grave, as he suddenly becomes a blur of motion, declaring the technique to be his Shadowhawk's talent. In the next instant, having crossed the distance between them, and even drawn blood as his sword is already about to leave Narutaro headless, if not for the pacifistic samurai leaning back to allow the attack to sail harmlessly overhead. Growling in retaliation and channeling his chakra, Naruto swings his sheathed blade towards the ground like a club, and is able to send a cloud of dirt and high-speed hail of stones at the Ushiha. Sasunosuke wisely leaps away from the dirt cloud so as not to be blinded, and does his best to deflect the high-speed stones, truly being shocked at the raw power the demon swordsman had, as a splinter from one of the rocks bruises his shoulder, evening the two up on drawn blood. Exasperated, Narutaro declares this to be enough as he doesn't want to kill the black swordsman, but will if he must. However, this only serves to enrage Sasunosuke, as he once again uses his fast pace and ultra discipline technique based Uchiha school of Kenjutsu to try and cut his opponent down roaring furiously that he can't be killed by a coward who refused to draw their blade, and leaving Narutaro on the defensive as he does his best to block or dodge every blow given to him, finally getting an opening for a counterattack after the samurai's last high-speed thrust misses him, allowing an opening for Narutaro to reverse his grip on his sword so that he now holds it upside down by the tip of its scabbard, at which point he swings it for only the second time during the conflict, sending the handle of the blade crashing into Sasunosuke's midsection to draw the air from his lungs, and even forcing him to double over in pain and exhaustion. It is only then that he realizes that this demon swordsman wields a broken and rusted sword. The blade looking to have been broken long ago, most likely. Snarling indignantly to know the meaning of this, Narutaro proudly declares that it was by the sword that his parents were slain. Of course he wouldn't actually carry one. More furious than ever, Sasunosuke pushes past the point of caring for his honor, and so frees his hand to weave shinobi signs, causing the blonde warrior to gasp in shock, as suddenly Sasunosuke's blade begins to crackle with electricity. 
and this time when he charges, it is at a pace that would make a lightning bolt appear like molasses, declaring that a demon has no right to lecture an officer of the shogunate about justice and morality. But if winning this battle means using techniques that require the discarding of his honor, then so be it. Narutaro tries to block the electrified attack, but instead of halting it, his scabbard is merely sliced through as if nothing more than a block of tofu. Leaving him shocked both literally and physically, Asasunosuke goes for the killing blow. However, instead of his blade slicing clean through flesh, instead it is halted in mid-air, as Narutaro has formed a glowing ball of spiraling energy in order to cancel out Sasunosuke's shinobi assassination technique. More importantly, allowing him to catch and snap Sasunosuke's sword, which stuns the Uchiha as he prepares to roar the insolence to destroy a weapon used by his ancestor Izuna, only to instead end up biting his tongue as his eyes are shot to the back of his skull, thanks to the demon swordsman driving an uppercut into his chin strong enough to lift his feet off the ground and leave him nearly unconscious as he lands flat on his back, unable to move. As he watches Narutaro grumpily remake his bindle and begin to walk away, Away, he roars at him that he has no honor, and to kill him rather than dishonor him and leave him in the same state. However, Narutaro only flips him off and leaves the Uchiha to pass out on the side of the road. Not long after, Sasunosuke awakens, now enraged as with his broken sword, he cannot even slit his own belly. It is only now that he regrets refusing the aid of one of the eight demon blades. However, this thought forbids him to question why the ninth demon swordsman was so strong, with no real school of swordsmanship. As compared to him, he should be nothing, seeing as how he had trained under every master swordsman of his clan, the Demon Blades, and even the third Shogun himself. So if it was not demonic power that created such a difference in strength, then what? And with this curiosity, the Uchiha sets off in the direction Narutaro left off to track him down. Meanwhile, Narutaro checks the contents of his bindle, feeling both disappointment and shame when he finds ants having invaded the food he'd scored for his little family of vagabonds. Growling, he curses the raven-haired swordsman and trudges on, thinking about how every time he's been hungry since meeting them 10 years ago, they'd always come through. He then flashes back to that time, back when he'd been cast out from all society with no idea why. His only way of surviving the harshness of the wilderness initially being the kindness of the odd stranger or elder near the countryside who didn't know of his heritage, only to be inevitably cast out once again when the shogunate's forces would come to investigate rumors. Aside from luck, the boy had also been blessed with guts, willing to stare down and confront whoever for whatever reason, and thus turning the boy into a bandit by the mere age of four. But only once he'd stolen his first sword did he truly live up to the name Demon, rusting the metal beyond repair with the rivers of blood he'd cast down as his inner demon drove him to lash out with iron to express his hate. On that path, he'd likely have been found and slain if a man sent by the shogunate hadn't been particularly sympathetic to his plight. Their names were Kakashimon, the apprentice of his father, Obitosuke, a shinobi who'd pledged his loyalty to Kakashimon and his father, and finally, Itachijiro, a samurai who had trained his whole life in order to snuff out Narutaro's. After giving the boy his first real taste of defeat, instead of blood, they offered him shelter, food, kindness, love, and the name left to him by his late parents. All three becoming the closest thing he had to a family after he'd learned of their fate, and all three supporting his decision to never pick up a blade in order to kill for a petty reason again. To that end, the three band together to raise the child and impart him all their knowledge, so that when the inevitable day comes that when he must stand against the nation state, which labels him demon, he will have the strength of one, but tempered by the compassion and patience of the great Buddha, just as the four shogun and Odan Kushina wished. Due to Sasukunosuke's skill of yard of tracking, he is able to find Narutaro's trail and catch up with his target, at least enough to observe him from a distance, seeing as Narutaro arrives to a shoddy shack and calls out to the gray-haired man leisurely sitting on his porch and reading a scroll, referring to the man and his father and asking where other father and brother are. Kakashimon lazily greets him back and points towards the inside of the shack, saying that since this adoptive son took his sweet time getting back there, their other housemates took it upon themselves to go out and scrounge up some sustenance for them. Then suddenly, out from the shack steps Itachijiro to tell the two that he has made eggs for them all to eat. However, he freezes seeing that Narutaro's sword and scabbard are currently gone, though before he can question it, Sasunosuke reveals himself. Declaring his intention to fulfill his destiny, but now unarmed and outnumbered, the result is the same, even when he once again relinquishes his honor in order to try and kill the assassination technique barehanded, only to be stopped by the family of Ronin all working perfectly together. As they restrain him, the older Uchiha declares to his brother that he is ignorant of the true darkness of the samurai world, while Narutaro agrees, saying that if honor turns family against itself, he's glad he has absolutely none of it. But that plus ultra fam is where we'll be leaving this story off forever. Well, that does it for this one, you guys. What did you think of the more hardcore shift into the samurai setting and just kind of jumping right into it? And the very small use of chalk for ninjutsu that you saw at the very end with Sasuke and Naruto's duel. Hope you enjoyed because I will not be setting up the third and final part even half as much as I did this one. 
because we are gonna hard jump in and the only real world building you're gonna need is that chakra does exist people just don't really know how to use it very well and they really only gives access to superhuman strength if understood and trained in basically my aim for it is to be that kind of classic meant to be super serious and low-key hitman that does insane over the top feats of superhuman strength to do what is meant to be covert assassin slash spy work in modern day slash realistic world settings so again make sure you're subbed and everything so you don't miss when that one comes out there are no real shout outs this time around, but I do want to really thank Pickle Dill for convincing me to give Rurouni Kenshin a real read. As it was number one, a really good source of inspiration, and number two, I became genuinely invested. I'm actually almost halfway through the 255 chapter manga, and I've only been reading for maybe two weeks. And aside from Pickle, thanks to Maxi Uchiha22 and any others who provided the renders used. This video is sponsored by DJ the Lazy Gamer and Crimson Manifesto. Hey everyone, and welcome to the final part of the three-part Naruto miniseries, What If Naruto Was Not About Ninja. Like last time, I'm not going to spend a lot of preamble getting you kind of caught up with what the series is supposed to be about and what I'm going to be doing in this part. All of those things are kind of detailed in the first two parts, especially a lot of the setup for this one, because I just want to jump right in. My inspirations, however, are the Shinmu series, the Yakuza series, Mission Yozakura family, Spy X family, or Spy By family as I call it, and most of all, Sakamoto Days. Sakamoto Days is so amazing that it truly inspired this entire miniseries. I had the idea in my head to do one of these set in modern time, kind of taking the route of what Sakamoto Days does, which is it's a bunch of hitmen who are supposed to be stealthy and covert and not kind of easy to notice doing all these superhuman feats, like building level destruction and some of the best choreography and jump right now. So above your duties of making sure you leave a like on this video and commenting your thoughts and all that other YouTube stuff, you're gonna wanna make sure that at some point you either pick up the Sakamoto Days manga or when it inevitably gets an anime make sure you're watching that because i promise you it's gonna be dope now as i said at the end of the samurai part the lore and backstory of our premise here is very much the same and or just really really simple our change being that we will just be inserting a bunch of generations between that of Ashra and Indra and their first reincarnations. Or they can just be a bunch of names in between now, and then we just don't really get time to explore if you prefer that explanation. This means ninjutsu and therefore ninjutsu warfare are conceived, but from there not really expanded upon very well, as unlike in canon, the age of Hashirama and Madara comes a good few generations later. By the time they do, however, a large amount of the shinobi arts have already begun to be lost to time, with a very select few capable of molding their chakra able to do more than enhance themselves for superhuman abilities. And this is why it is so important to write down, record, and pass down traditions and historical things that you actually want to preserve. Also, just as an aesthetic difference of this world, the tail beasts don't necessarily emerge as beasts. When Hagoroma splits this universe's ten tails, the Biju are more, in this context, a set of nine ancient personas a killer can slip into and their physical manifestation is basically just a big chakra ghost, kind of like we see Kuroma do later in Boruto or reminiscent to the Shinigami. This is sort of like the concept of developing a persona to bear the moral weight and blame for any atrocious actions a Jinchuriki may take, casting the Jinchuriki more realistically as a flawed or afflicted person reacting naturally to a harmful environment. And because of this nature of the tailed beast, most civilians think of them a little more so as urban legends than as actual factual things that can deal damage to them and kind of affect their lives. So among some of the really amazing things we're going to be losing out on this world, like the Naruto world's really interesting and story-rich kind of architecture that we're not going to be able to have here, we are also of course losing our access to kaiju battles. The five great nations eventually come into enough skirmishes to consolidate most of the world between three major countries, made up of the remnants of the hidden leaf, stone, cloud, mist, and sand villages, and more than likely including some smaller yet nonetheless noteworthy villages which would also eventually be absorbed into the conflict via proximity, a la wave, waterfall, whirlpool, or rain. Civilization, machinery, and political slash monetary ambitions begin to shift the world over into one that much more resembles our own. A world where if hypothetically powerful people were to need certain people to be past tense, they'd want it done suddenly and professionally. This is Naruto in the world of assassins, Jinchuriki, Shadows of the Day. Our story begins with ramen, and more importantly, the boy selling it. A 16 year old orphan street kid with no family, future, or even a name to call his own. To most, he is known by the sobriquet Naruto for the famous fish cakes found floating in his fabulous food. Though generally good-hearted, he has a pretty prickly temper and a bad habit of picking fights with people, especially low-ranking Yakuza guys who try to use intimidation tactics to avoid paying for their food or to muscle protection money from his meager business. As a result of these scuffles, he is often forced to move around to avoid serious reprisal, having taken to selling ramen by cart and setting up in a new place in the city each day lest he fulfill his dream of affording new shoes via a concrete pair. However, no matter where he goes, one regular customer always seems to find him. 
a man by the name of Aruka, who sports a wicked looking scar across the bridge of his nose, and a stylized leaf tattoo on his neck. Naruto is street smart enough to know that Iruka probably hails from the leaf, one of the underworld's most notorious rumored assassin schools, where aspiring hitmen undergo an intensive three-year training program to learn how to not only kill, but kill their own weaknesses. The assassin schools were not a well-kept secret, the concept that shadows in the day pull certain strings not being new or even unique to this world. But that doesn't matter to the blonde, since to him, Iruka is amiable, loyal, and always leaves a sizable tip. Where that money is sourced from isn't his problem. The only downside to Iruka's patronage is that when he's around, other people tend to give the card a wide berth. However, that is not the case today, as after Iruka places his standard order, a large arm with extra Naruto Maki fish cakes, another man with shaggy pale blue hair approaches. There is something shifty to this guy's eyes, but even still, Naruto doesn't discriminate when it comes to customers. Asking the man what he'd like, a predatory smile then forms on his lips, as in a mild tone, he replies that he'd like Naruto's head in a box for his boss. Taking this for a bad joke, Naruto nervously chuckles and replies that though he's named after a fish cake, he doesn't really taste as good as one. But when the shaggy haired man's demeanor doesn't change, Naruto realizes this isn't a joke. The shifty man then pulls out a switchblade, leering that it's nothing personal. His boss just thinks the kid's gonna be a problem down the line, so now he's gotta do the icky job. Mouth suddenly dry, Naruto can't think of any words to defend himself, and so suddenly starts to back away from the cart. Unfortunately, far too soon for his liking, his back butts up against a brick wall, and though he wills himself to run, his legs are frozen. Then, just before the blue-haired man can ascend upon him, Iruka appears behind him, planting a blade of his own right at the attacker's throat right on his leaf tattoo. Furiously, Iruka asks the man who he calls Mizuki what he thinks he's doing, and with an equally furious whisper, Mizuki tells Iruka, who he addresses with the honorific song, clarifying that underboss Shimura ordered this. Sighing, Iruka calls the underboss's plan short-sighted, since he's already so close to confirming Boss Third's hunch. But Mizuki shrugs that it's not for a grunt like him to question, he just whacks who the higher-ups say. Seeing that they won't be able to talk this out, Iruka barks at Naruto to run, and this at last snaps the boy out of his fear, causing him to sprint as though his life depends on it, which in this case, it does. Behind him, Naruto hears the sound of punches being thrown, and a grunt from who he can only assume is Iruka. But he doesn't dare to look back. He doesn't have time to check on the scarred man. He doesn't have time to make sure his cart hasn't been stolen. All he can do is keep his eyes forward and get away from Mizuki as fast as he can. Thankfully, having grown up on these streets, he knows their secrets better than anyone. Ducking through an alleyway and scaling a chain link fence before leaping onto a fire escape and scrambling through a gap into a boarded up window. This joint used to be Uchiha's dry clean, but since it mysteriously went out of business a few years ago, it's been a good place to hide out when things get rough. Letting out a sigh that there is no way Mizuki will think to look for him here, Naruto drops to the floor, allowing himself to at last think of Aruka and what he said about Boss Third's hunch, whatever that means. He doesn't know anyone by that name, just as he'd never heard of Mizuki's boss, it's also confusing. Unfortunately, he is not given long to wonder, as a sound fills his ears that chills his soul. The rattle of someone climbing the fence and the clang of them landing on the fire escape. Peeking through his entrance, he sees Mizuki stalking towards him. Damn it, how do you know he was here? The motion of Naruto's head then catches the assassin's attention, and as he turns to look at it, the predator and prey meet eyes. With a mighty kick, Mizuki shatters the board obscuring the window and steps through, his full height towering over the prone Naruto. He then pulls a handgun from the waistband of his jeans, while fishing around for a clip of bullets in his pocket. When he finds it, he clips the magazine in and levels the pistol in Naruto's head, chuckling that it's the end of the line for the so-called demon brat. His end now in sight, Naruto doesn't feel the same fear he felt back at the cart. Instead, he feels the same anger which always courses through him when he has to feed those Yakuza assholes a knuckle sandwich. This burning rage calming him and giving him something to focus on, as he decides if he's going out, it's not gonna be like a punk. And so baring his teeth, he lunges forward, smacking the firearm so his projectile merely grazes his scalp rather than piercing and splitting it, thus resulting in a trickle of blood to flow down his face as if oil used to anoint him. And more importantly, he slams his head into the assassin's chin to discombobulate him. He then throws a punch of his own, and then another, and another, feral fury bubbling up inside him, until finally, it feels as though there is too much to contain within himself, and so it leaks out, bathing his whole body in killing intent, and drowning Naruto's brain in the euphoria of violence. Though nothing physical changes, it is like Mizuki can see this, as when Naruto truly goes berserk, he screams, dropping his weapon and crawling away. Now it is his turn to come up against the brick wall, and unluckily for him, there is no kindly Iruka to save him. Letting out a bestial cry, Naruto leaps on his cord once again, resuming his punching and kicking and even biting every square inch of him, as his mind has obviously gone into a fugue state as the violence has kicked up 11 more notches. Mizuki's unconscious body quickly turning into a tool for Naruto to use in breaking down the building. As he begins pushing, stomping, and tackling his attacker through several different rooms and floors, the speed and power he's generating. 
leaving many random residents of the neighborhood confused by their new windows, skylights, or trash holes, as the blonde had moved far too fast to proceed. Time becomes meaningless in the state, and though only a few seconds pass in Naruto's perception, when he calms enough to look up and find himself outside, he sees the orange light of dust color in the sky, while police sirens wail in the distance and grow closer. At his feet, Mizuki has been reduced to nothing but a bloody heap, lying unconscious with his teeth strewn around him, and a look around reveals a large portion of the nearby apartment complex had suffered a similar fate, as it was now leveled to the ground, while behind him, another figure watches, a mix of interest and concern on his face, Iruka. As the scarred man approaches, Naruto sees a bloody stab wound on his side, no doubt received from trying to protect him, and so goes to apologize, but Iruka stops him, speaking first and asking what happened. Naruto admits that he doesn't really know. Sometimes when he gets in scraps, his mind gets a bit hazy, but he's never fully blacked out like this before. It's almost like some demon possessed him. Face hardening, Haruka sighs that he thought that would be the case, before telling Naruto to follow since the police would be far less understanding to Naruto's confusion and his part in all this. Sick of being confused, Naruto refuses, saying he's not going anywhere until Haruka starts explaining himself. With a tired look, the man discourages this as stupid, before scooping Naruto up and zipping to the rooftops in a flicker of superhuman speed. Once safely from the now crime scene, Naruto reiterates his demand, now further motivated to know exactly how all these crazy things were happening. Iruka rolls his eyes, explaining that what Naruto just did was tap into the ninth demon persona, a state of mind capable of granting improved strength, but at the cost of a feral temperament. His boss, Boss Third, has long suspected Naruto might be capable of this, since his mother, an assassin known as Red Hot Kushina, was the last known master of this form. That's why he's had him keep an eye on Naruto. This all makes the boy's head spin, as it sounds like some wacky plot of a manga. But for the moment, he suppresses that, focusing instead on the more important question, where Ruka is taking him. Smiling, the brown-haired assassin responds that he's taking him to the leaf. They've got undeniable proof that he's got that killer instinct, so it's high time he'd be taught how to use it properly. Naruto gawks at the idea of entering the criminal underworld, only to be sent to some snooty school, much less one where everyone is training to learn to better and more efficiently take lives. Some hesitance being born from the idea that there may also be more like Mizuki, who work for whoever this person who views him as a danger is. However, Iruka having firmly cemented himself as an ally, casually places a hand atop the blonde's head, rubbing it soothingly and expressing to him that things would all turn out alright since an even larger portion of Boss Third's reasoning for ordering Naruto's retrieval finally is so he may find a quality of life not so unfit for even the city's most unwanted strays, who'd commonly be fed or sheltered by strangers. This comparison makes Naruto's jaw set, and as he introspectively considers what he truly wants and whether it can be attained on this new path, he questions whether he'll really have to kill people someday. Iruka can only offer a small smile and a curt nod in the affirmative, concretely setting the expectations of this new arrangement. So with a sigh, Naruto rises and states he'll do it, but only for the sake of living to spite those who want him dead. Looking to Iruka, he asks where they start. With a smile, Iruka claims at the beginning, as he suddenly chops Naruto across the neck to knock him unconscious, scooping him back up and chuckling that orientation was always his favorite part of school. But that, friends, is where we'll be leaving this tale as well as this mini-series off seemingly forever. Hey guys, before we sign out, I do want to give a very special shout out to Pickle Dill who helped me get the actual kind of thoughts and bullet points for this script actually expanded out into an actual story. And I also want to apologize because I will admit I probably bit off a little more than I could chew with this miniseries. The big thing is that it was always going to be just really disappointing to start these really interesting stories and then leave them off. And I also think I got a lot of this kind of itch out of my system with the second one when I sat there the entire time and I, I wholeheartedly brag the third one would be the best. As it stands, I would probably rank them as Samurai, Assassin, and then Magic. And that's mostly because the Magic one was so much set up more so than me actually getting to sit down and tell a story. My biggest issue with this one really comes down to the fact that it just feels a little too generic to me. Like if I read this in an actual manga, I don't think I would be as hooked as I would want to be. But you know, if I actually spent the time that would be taken for the first chapter of a manga, you know, 50 pages or 60 pages, um, this part would have been way longer. It would have covered a lot more. It would have showed a lot more of the, the actual like, the training Naruto's about to go into, you set up the school system and stuff like that. So I do cut it off right before he gets to the most interesting part. I do recognize that. And because of that, I am probably a little more open to continuing any of my runs of these, probably in some podcast forms, not really in full story, because I do think these are still not necessarily suited for full stories, at least for me. 
but I'm a little more open to doing more with these than I was when I first started. Something else is I've actually already had a few of you reach out to me to let me know like, hey, you do wanna give your own takes on these or you do wanna kinda start from where I started. So one thing I'm gonna try and do, and I, I do want you guys to kinda stay on me and remind me to do this, is I wanna pin a comment That'll just kind of be my notes of where I would go from where I left off with the first three parts. Or if you didn't want to use those versions, what I would consider when writing my own version of this kind of same prompt. Other than that, I am going to go ahead and just let this series be done because it does feel like a bit of a trap to get stuck in a rut of thinking like, oh, these all have to be perfect, especially when right now they're not that popular with you guys. I think they'll probably be a little better received when they're all kind of compiled together, which is also why I'm going to be editing this one podcast style. That plus the fact that it's kind of New Year's and I'm still trying to relax it a little bit and I'm still a little sick. So please let me know what you thought of this last part as well as the mini series as a whole. Look out for those notes. I'm going to try and give those to you guys as well. And last but not least, I'm going to go ahead and shout out our patrons and get on, get out, on out of here. Crimson Manifesto, DJ the Lazy Gamer, Dominique, Knuckles OX, Pizza 15X, Aaron Winters, Narku, Normandy 1998, Jay Ray, Steven Norton, Shao P, Anthony Canales, Daniel Smith, Inurbriated, Infernate Beast 326, Jamal Hayden, Kevin, Adrian Carr, Samuel Rivera, Vegito Gaming 78, and Zach Haji.